Hi, this is Paul. This video is going to be all over the place. I hope it's good. I want to start with this conversation between Sam, who those of you in our little community know very well who he is, and he had a conversation with Father John Bear. Now, um, over the last four years, a lot of people have been singing the praises of Father John Bear and are um, very ortho- uh, curious and interested and fascinated community. I There are so many people out there, so much stuff to listen to. I don't always get around to things too much, but uh, Sam talked to him and I listened to this conversation and yeah, I'm a fan. Uh, there was a lot of really good stuff in here and uh, hopefully a bunch of things will come together. Part, you know, I've just I've just had a lot of work to do. Um, just my day job as a pastor with classes and synod and all those kinds of things and, and what a lot of these monologue videos and my listening habits all sort of weave in together because I try to always be working on sermons and working on my Sunday school class while I'm working on these monologues and find the intersection between them and in, in that way sort of always do double or triple duty with however I spend my time and there are some really I did a lot of learning in this video about understanding the ancient world. Now, Father John Baer is a, um, a patristic scholar and an expert on the patristic. That means the church fathers. A huge part of dealing with human beings are just trying to understand each other. And our cultural assumptions that are so often so deep down deep within us that we can't know them and see them or where they come from or where they're going is a big piece of this. So I want to play a little bit of this and hope I can do justice to it in the limited time that I have. Firstly, let's just, you just go back to that first sentence in his chapter on Christ. Now, now, Sam, of course, is a biblical Unitarian, and so he's in these conversations, quite interested in origin. This conversation is about origin, the church father, and the trinity. And uh, Bear, Bear was just marvelous during this conversation. I, I've just, I was just so impressed. Okay, um, because it, it's fundamentally important. He says, in the first place, we must know that in Christ, the nature of his divinity as the only begotten son of God is one thing. Another is the human nature, which in the last times he took an account of the economy. Okay. That's like a fundamental theological statement, which occurs in... Now, I know some of you have already checked out or rolled your eyes or something, because, oh, we're going to get loud into to, way down into deep theology, et cetera, et cetera. But if you hang in there with me, I promise we're going to get into stuff that's quite relevant to the kinds of conversations I've been having and thinking about. And that's, again, part of the point that I made with respect to I weave this into the life that I'm living. In, in all theology thereafter and actually the dynamics of that sentence is grounded in in proverbs 8 22 to 25 okay but that's which he then follows on from okay but just think about the statement the one lord jesus christ is the son of god become the son of man for our sake okay They're just reducing it down to that what's the relationship between the is and the become you got you. You got two different clauses mm -hmm. affirmed of one subject. Yeah. The one Lord Jesus Christ is the Son of God, become the Son of Man for our sake. The become the Son of Man always has a. Now, it, it's also when you think about the Son of Man, most of us in our culture just simply think of his as a human being, and that's certainly a layer in the background of Daniel seven in that passage. But the Son of Man is a title that um, basically Jesus uses it as a title to describe his role in the rescue of humanity. The purpose clause, mm -hmm. the is doesn't. That's yeah. Proverbs 8, 22 to 25, okay? You've got two things affirmed about the one subject. You've got two different verbs. He is, he becomes. Mm -hmm. So what's the relationship between the is and the become, okay? The, the two things I would point out would be that the, the is has ontological priority. Mm -hmm. This is who he is. Now, ontology is being, and epistemology, which he's about to say, is knowing. Yeah. The become has epistemological priority. It's on the basis of what he's done that we can say who he is. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's fascinating. Ontological priority, epistemological priority, the reverse of each other. Now, before he's about to make the next point, this is my point about how deep our culture is, our assumptions, our presumptions, the filters through which we listen to things. When you heard become, I bet you almost all of us switched into temporal mode, a mode that I don't think is prioritized by this other culture. But both of those are made about the one Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, mm -hmm. What there isn't between the two is a temporal priority. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Ontological, epistemological. So logical relationship. It's not a temporal relationship. I would argue. Yeah. Okay. Now, what we now it's very difficult, I think, for us to conceptualize a purely logical relationship and not have it be temporal. And I don't think that's a human limitation. I think that's a cultural filter all too often want to do is to make it a temporal relationship right. he is a son of god before he becomes a son of man right right yeah okay now if you do that you've done several things okay first of all you've introduced a temporal gap into the life of god mm -hmm. he is and then later on becomes man mm -hmm. yeah and so my question would be well how old was he when he was born of Mary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then you start to realize, you know, was he 5,000? Was he 10 million? I mean, and then you start to realize the absurdity of thinking of it chronologically. Mm -hmm. yeah? Now, now this, a while ago, I played a little clip from Jordan Peterson when he was talking to those two Roman Catholic theologians with Word on Fire, and they got into this issue a little bit with respect to how we sort of project backwards sort of a clock mechanistic way and think about the past in that way. And then we sort of project forwards. And, and, and the point is we just keep introducing time into things imaginatively. And that's natural for us because that's how we live. But is that helpful? Is it fair? Does it distort? But that's what you've done if you introduce it before, a temporal before, yeah. rather than a logical before. Absolutely mm -hmm. logical before, ontology, epistemology, no doubt about it. Okay. Yeah. What you've also done is not you've not only introduced a temporal gap, you've also changed the subject. Because if you can introduce a temporal gap, you'd now have to say, the word of God is the son of God, mm -hmm. who later on becomes a son of man as Jesus. Yeah. You've mm -hmm. actually changed the very subject from the one Lord Jesus Christ to the Word of God. Now, I know that it's very easy theologically to just sort of um, equate all of these things, but there's an agent arena relationship with all of these factors that they, they belong in some ways within their own contexts of understanding. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah and then thirdly you would actually end up with the technically a dioprosopic christology what's usually be called nestorian christology because what you've now done is you've got a set of identifying properties for the word of god and a different set of properties for jesus mm -hmm. yeah you know the word of god who is from before yeah. This is a kind of pre incarnate word. How would you identify him? Well, the identifying properties for that must be other than the identifying properties for Jesus, if you're going to make a distinction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, Origin doesn't do that. Origin doesn't go that route, nor for that matter do the creeds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The Creed of Nicaea, I believe in one God the Father and one Lord Jesus Christ, who's begotten of the Father before all ages. The creeds don't even use the term word of God. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, which is striking you know yeah we yeah. kind of mentally substitute right one god the father one lord jesus christ he's the word of god begotten by the and then he becomes man and is called jesus but that's not the structure of the language yeah yeah we we, we kind of don't listen to what we're actually saying mm -hmm. yeah so what this then tells us is rather than changing the subject 
from the one Lord Jesus Christ. I'd be even more specific. The one Lord, the, the crucified and risen one, as proclaimed by the apostles in accordance with scripture, encountered in the breaking of the bread. That's the one Lord Jesus Christ we're concerned with. Not Jesus as Barabbas might have remembered him. Mm-hmm. Or yeah. Pontius Pilate, or whoever. Yeah. It's, it's this, the one Lord Jesus Christ, the crucified and risen. Notice, notice what he just said. It, not to Jesus, it's a little difficult to understand. As Barabbas might have remembered him. In other words, he's, he's very much getting into ontology and epistemology that there's the distinction between it one as proclaimed by the apostles in accordance with the scriptures that's when we're talking about yeah what we can now say is that logos word is a title of him yeah yeah it's, it's, it's a title of this one which is exactly how it is in new testament right okay, and, so you've got, and he's you've very got, you've got, you've got, you've got so you've got word of god in the pro, in, in the prologue Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you know, I wrote a book trying to argue that in the way the earliest readers do it is that t- the term logos, logos word in the prologue is already a reference to Jesus Christ. It's not right. They become. I, it's Jesus not a, a pre-incarnate something. Yeah, yeah. and then uh, then the most glaring, the only the only of the places in Revelation, whatever chapter it is, where the rider on the white horse with the robe dipped in blood is known by a name, and the name is Word of God. It's a title attributed to him. Right, and Origen says that quite explicitly in the commentary. Oh, yeah, but Origen says even more, because he's starting with the the Proverbs Mm. verse. And and that Proverbs verse, he's starting, you know, after the passage I read to you, he then goes on to quote it, the Lord created me the beginning of his ways, Proverbs 8.22. That is the text which then becomes controversial. Yeah. Right, right. Um, I was going to say was that... uh, uh, the first title of Christ for o- okay. Now I want to jump ahead a little bit to be beyond space and time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, space and time are measurements of this world, as we were just talking about spatial temporal configuration. Space and time are measurements of God's creation. They're not measurements of God. Okay, so the iron, the created iron, us, you know you, me, everybody, as like, like the iron goes into the fire uh, through death and resurrection, and I'll come back to it as well, because Corinthians 15 is so important for him. Um, we absolutely remain human beings, but we're now known by the properties of the fire. Yeah. Now, now there's this long section in the middle that I skipped that talked about this origin loves this illustration of, let's say, a knife that is out in the cold, and then you put it in the fire. Is it the same knife? Now, fire is this recurrent image of God, and this heating that the that the that the fire does of the knife, um, and it's still the same knife. But now the knife has possibilities and powers that the knife didn't have before, and it has those powers obviously from the fire. But it remains a knife, and so he's he's going on further into that. And so, if you were to put, say, um an iron knife in the fire, representing humans, and a bronze knife in the fire, representing, say, angels, they're both indistinguishable, Mm -hmm. which is why he speaks to them as being rational beings. Yeah. Yeah, They they absolutely remain iron and bronze and whatever other metal, but they're they're indistinguishable. They they remain that, but God is all in all. Yeah, and Mm -hmm. it's known by the purpose of that. Now, one further thing with regard to that would be, we tend to think using the image of iron going into the fire for death and resurrection and so on, yeah? We tend to think, you know, I was born at a certain moment in time. I was not before that. That's absolutely true. But my end is actually to enter into that. Mm -hmm. I'm not dead yet. Hopefully in a few more years or whatever. But at some point I'm going to die and hopefully raised and we can get into all of that kind of discussion, but raised and, and enter into that consuming fire that is God. Now, we tend to think of it as, getting back to this question of temporality and eternity, we tend to think of it as, you know, I will die in X number of years' time, rise, and I'll be enter and be in God and be in God thereafter. Mm-hmm. Yeah? But there is no before or after. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There is no before or after in God. Yeah. Doesn't yeah. that mean that I have to say that although I'm not there yet, I'm still here? Yeah. 
You know, I was right. born in 1966. I'm not yet dead. I, you know, I was yeah. not in 1965. No way. Yeah, absolutely yeah. not. But if my end is to enter into the eternity of God, mm-hmm. I think I have to say I'm already there and I always have been. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, the Bible talks that way all the time. And it's it, it's very difficult for us to understand because of obviously our cultural filters through which we appropriate the world and through which we try to understand these things. And, and there, there are a lot of layers in, into what he just went through there too that I don't want to go into because I've got some other things I want to get to and I have a council meeting at 7 o'clock. So um, my wife is out to dinner with a friend and so I have a little extra time to make this video. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Eschatologically speaking or teleologically speaking or however you want to qualify, but not temporally speaking. Right. Okay, and that that teleologically speaking is 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 very important in there because a lot of what we're struggling with with certain issues I think has to do with this issue of teleology and the presence of teleology. This was the conversation that Sam had had with John Verveke, then this was a conversation that that John and I had with Sam, the three of us, that we're, we're, we're dealing with this question of teleology. What, what is teleology? What do I mean by that? It means purpose and to what it's pointing to. And there, there's a degree when you look at things sort of outside of time, and some of you might say, well, we never look at things outside of time. I'd say, no, remember the upper and lower registers. We regularly look at things outside of time. Down here below, we don't. And earlier he talked about, you know, origin very much doing that same thing. Always looking heaven and earth, above and below, above and below. In the upper register, in the world of our mind, I don't age. And I've talked about that before. I've talked about going and visiting my grandmother. And my grandmother, I was a college student at that point, you know, in my um, late teens, early 20s. And my grandmother there in her 80s and looking at me and saying, you know, it might be hard for you to believe, but... You know, outside you see me like this, but inside I feel your age. Grandma, what does that mean? The upper and lower register. And we we certainly in modernity have a preference for the lower register. When we say that this is foundational and this is this is basic and this is derivative. In in that sense, you almost any any imagining escaping time is always imagined to be illusory, even though those who, let's say, I haven't talked much about Sam Harris's app. I did download Sarah's Sam Harris app, and I listened to a thing or two, and I thought, well, I could, I could talk about this. That whole meditation thing, well, that's up here too. Because, in fact, that's, that's what you're trying to get away from. Right. And that kind of goes back to what we talked about earlier. I came into existence as a result of my parents' sexual act mm-hmm. however many years ago. As I come to know myself in God or come to know God in me or however you want to put that, I come to realize he's called me into existence before the foundation of the world. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah? Yeah. It sounds very Calvinistic, you might say. Well, you know, Calvinists are just getting, the, getting this stuff from the Bible. Say, so, well, there's other things in the Bible. Oh, yeah, there are. And you know we're trying to figure out those things as we uh, as we put our put try to put the picture together. The this sort of parallel between temporal and eternal speaking. Yeah, you and, cannot think of it as being two parallel lines. Right. Right. Temp- right. You know, like time as a line is a measurement or a division of created reality. God is not in time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I think this is a perfect... So, 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 so j- j- just to finish off with that, that yeah. is why, for instance, Paul will say, my life is hidden with Christ in God. Yeah, or we are Our seated city. up in the heavenlies. Yeah, yeah all of that yeah. language in the present is so yeah. emphatic in the New Testament. We yeah. have a house not made by hands, eternal in the heavens. Yes, yeah. Yeah, all of that. That, that is where I think that language comes from. Mm-hmm. You can then easily see why... Those people who, for whatever reason, wanted to have a go at origin would present that as being souls falling into bodies. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So, related, directly related to that, um, Origin's famous example, which you already sort of have touched on, of 
of explaining the incarnation and the relation of Jesus's human soul to divinity is that of an iron in fire. Mm. And just in the same way that there's seemingly kind of a, a hierarchy of people's closeness to God, with some people being closer to God, some people being further away, some angels being closer to God, some angels and spirits being further away, that, that Jesus's rational soul is the soul that that never fell away right the soul that mm -hmm. uh, uh that stayed in the fire and became fully i think you said enkindled or or something mm -hmm. like that so it it certainly sounds like okay all of these souls in some sort of temporal sequence have varying degrees of moral affection towards god and then sort of based on that you know some a really good soul gets put in the sun the a pretty good soul gets put in the moon some good souls etc but jesus's soul super super good never fell away from from the logos became perfectly enkindled and then voluntarily perhaps at some point becomes uh ensouled or becomes no, enfleshed. I, yeah, but I, but yeah. I think you're saying that that's a, a mistaken way to, to that, that's understand really mistaken way, I think. Yeah. I think anyway. Yeah, I may be wrong. Mm -hmm. I have to be corrected. Yeah. The the passage you're talking about is in book two, chapter six, yeah, mm -hmm. where he says, you know, um God created all souls equally. He's he's no respecter of persons. Uh they all adhere to him with greater diff different degrees of love. Mm -hmm. um depending on their free will and volition whatever um and they all fell away apart from the one of whom jesus said no one takes my soul from me mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. i'm absolutely convinced that the locus that he's thinking about the scene that he's thinking about there is a passion mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah that is the example in and you know unless you really want to think you're thinking about some kind of mythological pre whatever you know yeah. which he just doesn't do the absolutely central locus of of all of this in scripture of, of falling away is a cross where all of those who were united to jesus fell away from him apart from one of and that's where the scriptural verse is important of whom he said no one takes my soul from me mm -hmm. because the next line is i lay it down of myself mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah so that, that's a passion and then in the light of that of all of them falling away from the wood of the cross we can now see that this is in fact what we've done from the beginning falling away from the wood of from the wood of the tree of life mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah so so that becomes the the the, the archi of understanding the whole thing okay mm -hmm. um in in the book on the comment on, on the gospel of john I I, I I i give it as a sentence I can kind of sum up what I see going on there in a sentence, which also draws, especially on Gregor of Nyssa, who's doing something very similar. And yeah, yeah. Into time. And then uh, there's a Greek writer called Panayotis Samalikis, who's written a number of really lengthy books on origin. Um, and he's got a very fascinating discuss discussion of the interaction between temporality and eternity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we are so used to thinking in temporal terms. Yeah. That's what we do. And in temporal terms, causality works forwards. Yeah. I do something, something else happens. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He argues that in the interaction between eternity and temporality, mm -hmm. causality works backwards. Right. Right. Okay. And mm -hmm. just to, I mean, that sounds rather perplexing, but just to make it very clear, put it this way Did Jesus die on the cross because Isaiah spoke about it? Or did Isaiah speak about it because he did? Right. Right. <laughs> it has to be the latter one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Otherwise, Jesus would be, I don't know, fulfilling that. Uh, yeah, fulfilling that because Isaiah said this, he then did this. Yeah. Yeah. The causality works backwards. Right. And and then the role of a prophet is speaking glimpses, in, speaking glimpses into this uh, uh, unveiled eternity yeah. that they're capturing in words. And, yes. and they describe pieces of it and parts of it. And yeah. then Jesus is the full exemplary. When, when I talk about the day of the Lord, I often talk about a pre-echo, which, of course, makes no sense in spatial temporal time, because an echo, obviously, you have the major event and then it echoes backwards. But the day of the Lord, uh, many things like this, when he talks about causality working backwards, is that way. Um, and, and he has more, he has more um, examples of it to come here, if I recall correctly.
version of it. Yep. Yeah. 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 And that would also explain completely why liturgically we always say today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know your liturgical background and so on, but in the Orthodox Church, you know, when we get when we get to Christmas, we say today Christ is born. Yeah. yeah. yeah? You don't say he's now 2021. In, in hymnody to Christ the Lord is risen today. Alleluia. One years old. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's nonsense to, to talk like that. Today Christ is born. Yeah. Or today uh, he's baptized, or today he dies on the cross, or whatever the, the thing is. So so one follow-up question that I sort of had to that is when when you read Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, uh, many of the anti Nicene fathers, they'll they'll talk about they'll try and prove Christ's divinity by putting him in the theophanies of the Old Testament, right? And Justin Martyr is kind of famously no, the well, first no, 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 let me let me correct you. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not they're putting him in the Old Testament theophanies. They're still of a of a generation where the scriptures, what we mm -hmm. call the Old Testament, the scriptures are the primary text for understanding this Christ. Yeah, yeah. I really do think. I think it's the first time I said it on a podcast, but I really do think that our now now what he just said there is so critical. The scriptures are the primary text. The scriptures that they had, you know. Paul, of course, comes later, but the scriptures are the primary text for understanding Christ. That, of course, is before you have what we call the New Testament. And, and what that means is that works because of this temporal relationship. What he talks about earlier in terms of unveiling, we'll see if he goes into that apocalyptic, or maybe I'll have to go back and, and, and play it because I didn't play it before. Biggest problem today is we've got a book called the Bible. <laughs> yeah, just, I don't know how we, we've got a book called the Bible, you know, a single volume, yeah, mm -hmm. which is ni nicely divided into Old Testament followed by New Testament, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and because it's called Old Testament, we, we going back to paratexts again, yeah, yeah, you know, just all that kind of stuff, we automatically read it as all the things that happened before Jesus, mm -hmm. yeah, and then we read the Gospels, the life of Jesus, and then we read Acts early church, and then we read Paul's letters, you know, now knowing the context he's walking, whatever, yeah? And we think because we're reading on a line like that, we're being historical. Right, right. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. If you want to think about it properly, it is the scriptures. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm, I'm on a kind of a crusade to try and get people to stop using the term Old Testament. <laughs> if the word scripture was good enough for Christ, for Paul, the evangelist, the Nicene Creed, yeah, probably good enough. Mm -hmm. yeah? Scriptures, Christ's passion, they're unveiled. The book is opened, the veil, yeah? and then you're preaching Christ on the basis of these scriptures, proclaiming the gospel. You're, you're understanding him by going back to these scriptures. Yeah, you're proclaiming the gospel. That's gone, going on for, what, 20, 30 years, whatever, and then Paul starts to write letters. Mm -hmm. okay, and in Paul's letters, he refer to the gospel, or my gospel. He doesn't explicitly really tell you what it is. Corinthians 15 might be the most, you know, yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then after that... I would argue that his stump speech in synagogues is in Acts 13. 10, 20, 30, whatever years after that, you get Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John writing their version of the gospel. Mm -hmm. Yeah? It's always the gospel according to. It's Matthew's yeah. version. Mark's version. And the word gospel there must refer back to what's been preached for the last 20, 30 years. Mm -hmm. okay? So mm -hmm. the word gospel there doesn't mean biography. It means gospel. Gospel according to. So scripture, passion, unveiling, proclamation, letters, gospels. Mm -hmm. That's a historical order. That's a hermeneutical order. And that's a liturgical order. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, because we've got this book called the Bible, which is an invention of the printing press, we tend to read as we know about Jesus from the New yeah. Testament, and then Justin and all the others are trying to put him back in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. No, they're reading the scriptures to understand who Christ is. Right, right. It's a very different thing. And again, keep that temporal line thing that, that when you get into modernity and when 
in the modern period, they wrestle and say, okay, well, how, how are we going to understand this? Well, we have to nail it down to the physical, and then the temporal comes in, and so we're going to put it on this clock, and it's going to run this way. Th that's, that's, that's 1,500 years after Christ. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. I, so I, I understand what you're saying, but uh, one thing that I notice is that, so like when, when Justin Martyr is, is saying that, you know, the, among the, the three angels who appeared uh, to Abraham, one of them was, was Christ, that these seem like to Justin uh, pre-human events in the temporal sequence of, of you know, Jesus. But Origen, I don't think ever does that a single time. Mm -hmm. And 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 I noticed that to be I once I realized I'm like, well, that's very unusual because it was so common among his peers to to do that. I wonder, I wonder if you have any thoughts think, on that or think, if I'm reading into that. No, I, I think Justin when I wrote my book The Way to Nicaea, it did seem mm -hmm. to me that Justin was slightly the odd one out in that. Yeah. Yeah. See, and even according to his peers. Is Justin Martyr and Origen appear? Well, they are because they're sitting in these books next to each other. <laughs> they're, they're, they're two people divided by, that could be very, quite a bit. Um, but maybe there is more going on with Justin, the way that he distinguishes between is and becomes, like mm -hmm. we talked about with the Christological statement, maybe there's more going on with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but or what Origen does, it, it's totally akin to what Irenaeus does in that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that Origen never talks about a activity of the soul of Jesus apart from um, as the Son of Man. Yeah. 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 I, I want to go back to the um, to the apocalypse, the apocalyptic reading. Let's see if I can. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm, um, I'm going to use the word apocalyptic. Mm -hmm. Just to describe it, and for, for the listeners, what I really mean by apocalypse is not a Hollywood apocalyptic end of the world drama, this and the other, but, but mm -hmm. simply unveiling. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I'm actually beginning to think ever more that the, the idea of unveiling apocalyptic is really at the heart of all theology. Mm hmm. Yeah. yeah. So we just take the example of the scriptural interpretation. Okay. Mm -hmm. the, the clearest example would be the Apostle Paul. He read scripture one way as, you know, a good rabbinic Jew trained under Rabbi Gamaliel and all the rest of it, and his reading it that way led him to persecute the Christians. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. just yeah. just no doubt about it. It didn't lead him to expect a crucified Messiah born of a virgin. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it really didn't. You know, those who were thinking that way, they've got it wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, he then encounters Christ, and now he reads it differently. Right. Okay. Right. And, and now it's... And now, well, 14 to 17 years of developing that, I mean, because there's this big gap. You don't find it in the book of Acts unless you read very carefully, but you look at Galatians. And I walked through some of that when we were doing Paul um, before before the liturgical seasons. And then he describes it in terms of the veil being lifted. Right. Okay, so there you've got um, the unveiling and you're reading it now in the light of the encounter with Christ and so on. But the unveiling also goes for for christ himself yeah mm -hmm. uh, while they were following him while, while the disciples were following him around they really didn't know who he was yeah. you know yeah. what kind of man is it that can uh, you know calm the waters and this that and the other yeah mm -hmm. even when you get to the gospel of john at the beginning where you got philip telling nathaniel we found the one of whom moses spoke in the law and the prophets also you know you, mm -hmm. you think gospel of john the highest level the scriptures aren't open in synoptics until the end of the synoptics, Road to Emmaus and so on, and that's when they get it. Gospel of John, it starts off in the beginning. We found the one of whom Moses in the law speaks and the prophets also, but then he carries on, Jesus, the son of Nazareth, uh, Jesus, the son of Joseph of Nazareth. But mm -hmm. well, that's not quite who he is. So they're still working that way. After the Passion, as the scriptures are unveiled, we now know who he actually is. He's the eternal word of God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's an unveiling of in Christology. Mm -hmm. yeah? yeah um but this unveiling is now also an unveiling of ourselves so paul in second corinthians 4 and 5 talks about a veil light lying over our minds yeah so the unveiling would be you know i come into existence 
as a result of my parents' act of sexual procreation. Mm-hmm. And then you get into all sorts of discussions about, you know, sin did my mother conceive me, original sin, whatever, all of that, yeah? And I think it's completely mistaken. The problem with my birth is not whatever was going on between my parents. The problem is that I was passive in it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I had no choice. <laughs> yeah. Nobody asked me. It's not a voluntary birth. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. Nobody asked me. Here I am. I've been thrown into existence, an existence in which whatever I do, I die. It sucks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, really. Yeah. Okay, that's how I know myself to begin with. Yeah, but as I continue to grow from Adam to Christ, I'm also unveiled, and I come to realize that in fact, you no, know, God called me into existence before the foundation of the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, now that before is not a chronological before. Before my parents had sexual intercourse, God called me. Chron- chron- no, obviously not. Yeah? It mm. means that the ground of my existence is, in fact, God's call. The material means by which I've come into existence my parents, but the real ground of my existence is God's call. Mm. Okay? But I don't know that from the beginning. I think I'm the, I think I'm the son of my mother and father. Mm. Yeah? As I continue to grow, to take up the cross, to put on Christ and all those kind of things, I'm unveiled and my real identity is revealed. Yeah. Okay? So uh, the veiling and veiling is not just with respect to scripture, it's with respect to everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then you can really say um, liturgy. Well, what is liturgy apart from veiling and unveiling? Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. so yeah. if you were to explain Eucharistic gifts, I wouldn't do it in terms of transubstantiation and <laughs> change of elements and accidents and attributes and whatever else, all of that. I would do it in terms of veiling and unveiling. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, it appears as bread and wine, yeah, mm-hmm. but unveiled in the act of liturgy, as consumed by us, by the believers, by the faithful, who themselves become the body and blood of Christ. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, veiling and unveiling. It's it's a thing which holds it all together. So okay, now I promised that I wasn't just going to stay here at the theological at the um, at, at this level. There there is actually a an application that I want to bring this to. So today I, I released the um, the video that's quite a bit about the Christian Reformed Church and its struggle with same-sex marriage. And uh, this this is an ongoing conversation on CRC Voices. It's obviously going to be a topic of concern and a lot of energy. And there's, as with many things, there, there, there are many, many things to say about this. It also... For those of you following along with my adult Sunday school class, you know that I am in Romans 1. And those who are familiar with this issue know that um, once you start getting into Romans 1, you get into one of the passages which is uh, which is in the middle of this discussion. I'll say it that way. If I have everything. So uh, I'm reading out of this Lexham English Bible, which which has its usage in some ways. Um, and I, 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 I dealt with this. You can find last week's Sunday School class. I posted it on the channel. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God and the likeness of and the likeness of an image of mortal human beings and birds and quadrupeds and reptiles. And I talked about that in the Sunday School class, and I'll talk about that more this week in terms of... Um, it it gets into this question of, um, you know, we often call it the fall, and and we we dominantly think in 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 strong timelines in this way. Now, again, I don't want to divorce us from timelines entirely. That's part of our culture. That's part of temporal reality, um, and and to just and to just lose timelines completely. That can take you in all sorts of nasty directions, too. Um, There's a lot of giving over. Uh, Verse 24, Therefore God gave them over to the desires of their hearts to immorality, that their bodies would be dishonored among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God with a lie and worshipped and served the creation rather than the creator. And I talked about that last week in terms of, you know, those of you, the bunch of these eco Kaufman stuff, I brought a lot of that in. Who's blessed forever and ever? Now again, the 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 paragraph breaks here, or so all of your Bibles have it. Of course, they're not in the original, and part of what they sometimes do is obscure some of these structures because there's there's three giving over, and um, 
in verse 24 and verse 26 and um, in verse 28. And I'm not going to pull up the Greek and kind of show you the structures. That's for Sunday school, depending on whether I go into that. Verse 26, because of this, God gave them over. And, and that's, um, the, that's, that's pare, pare doken. It's a doken is to give and, and, and just, it's sort of relinquished and, um, you wanted it this way here. You, you, I'll give you what you want. I'll, I'll give you what you're asking for. I'll give you what you desire. Because of this, God, they gave them over to degrading passions for their females exchange the natural relations for the uh, for those contrary to nature. Now, we have this ongoing uh, game on this channel with Bionic Mosquito and Carl, who um, one of my one of my previous videos that got into politics, uh, you know, cursed me out as a fool to to. Um, to, that shouldn't that should not speak and no one should ever listen to and we'll see if Carl comes back he he has before but bionic mosquito is a little bit more durable and he hangs in there with the whole natural law discussion now so much revolves around this word natural and I, I deal with it a little bit in a number of the videos because C.S. Lewis deals with it in his book miracles because in many ways it's at the center of this transition from this classical worldview one of the things that I didn't drop in on that video with um, John Bear and and Sam is a lot of their conversations about arche. Well, what is arche? Arche is this Greek word. And one of the ways that it's commonly translated is first. But right there, you have the difficulty that we have in our culture. Because when we hear first, the, the thing we think about is temporal. That's our priority. We have these multiple dictionary definitions. Well, because, in a sense, consciousness is not only monofocal, but sequential in many ways, in terms of the stack of definitions of this word first, or even of RK, the temporal comes to mind. And that's that shuttled forward in the queue because of our culture, because of everything that's happened in the last thousand years in many respects. And we're, we're, we're deeply into that. And, and it's, it's so, so difficult for us to escape. Now, in, in some ways we can't escape it, but, but we must live with it. So this word natural. So then one of the things that you can do is, you know, this is Logos Bible software. Um, you can, okay, we're over in, in verse 26. Therefore, he gave them he gave them over the God into um, into dishonor. Um, there's the word physikon, and then fusen, and you can just do fun things like say, "Oh, let's do a little Bible word study," and bang, there it comes up. And here I have all these different resources that I can look at it and you can spend forever and ever working on this kind of thing. And um, one thing that might be helpful is the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, which goes into a bunch of different things. And again, you can look, C.S. Lewis deals with this fairly early in his book, Miracles, but um, the noun phusis is a verbal abstraction of ifun, or and it goes into some some from the Indo-European root, blah 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 blah, blah the trans, um, the Sanskrit, blah blah blah, the Latin, um, then of course will become natura, um, whose meaning is to become or to grow. Originally with reference to plant growth. Now, what, one of the things that you find, um, thus it means form, nature first with respect to plants get into Homer's Odyssey. Um, but what, what you find with many of these Greek words is that they they do have their basis in in a lot of in very at a very physical level. Um, in the Sunday school class I talked about wrath, which is sort of to swell and then worship or piety is sort of to retreat. So swell and retreat and and that's sort of the act of 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 worship 
worship obeisance in some ways. Now, now, here's the question. With this nature, if you look at Lewis in Miracles, I can pull it up. Before the naturalist and the supernaturalist can begin to discuss their difference of opinion, they must surely have an agreed upon definition of nature and supernature. Of course, supernature comes way later. But unfortunately, it's almost impossible to get to such a definition. Just because the naturalist thinks that nothing but nature exists. Well, what on earth do we mean by nature in that sentence? The word nature means to him merely everything or the whole show or whatever that is. Now, of course, Lewis is dealing in the context of his book. And if that is what is meant by nature, then, of course, nothing else exists. Now, the way that works in terms of our imagination, and again, this is, Sam Harris is right here in the same boat because I, I, Lewis, I think, basically describes a Sam Harris naturalism, is that from the instance of the first of the Big Bang physis, nature just carries on one thing after another. And now this this goes into Lewis's thesis in this book, which is basically reason is this power to interrupt the natural. Okay, so the natural is just this assumed process that goes and goes and goes and goes and you know, according to Sam Harris, we're just sort of a part of it and we're going on. But but notice all of the temporal timeline that's going on here. These are all of our concerns, far later than origin, far later than Paul here in 1 Corinthians. Um, let's see if I can... Well, I'll read a little bit more loose, then we'll go back to the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. Some philosophers have defined nature as what we perceive with our five senses. So then nature is this, the, the objective material order, let's say. But that is most unsatisfactory, for we do not perceive our own emotions in that way. Let's see if I can get rid of this thing. Have a little bit more. Oh, come on, come on. There we go. And yet we presumably, and yet they are presumably natural events, very much are in terms of Sam Harris. In order to avoid deadlock and to discover what the naturalist and the supernaturalist are really differing about, we must approach, we must approach our problem in a roundabout way. I begin by considering five sentences. Are those his natural teeth or a set? A dog in his natural state is covered with fleas. I love to get away from tilled land and meddled roads and be alone with nature. Do be natural. Why are you so affected? It may be, it may, it may have been wrong to kiss her, but it was very natural. A common thread of meaning in all these usages can easily be discovered. The natural teeth are those that grow in my mouth. We do not have to design them, make them, or fit them. The dog's natural state is the one he will be in if no one takes soap and water and prevents it. The countryside where nature reigns supreme is one where soil, weather, and vegetation produce the results unhelped and unimpeded by man. Natural behavior is the behavior which people would exhibit if they were not at pains to alter it. A natural kiss is the kiss which will be given if moral or prudential considerations do not intervene. In all the examples, nature means what happens of itself or of its own accord. What you do not need to labor for, what you will get if you take no measure to stop it. The Greek word for nature, physis, is connected to the Greek verb to grow. Latin natura, connected to be born. The natural is what springs up or comes forth or arrives or goes on. Notice how temporal all of that is in our imagination. And so we, we sort of imagine that the Big Bang on the world just goes forward and that becomes the substrata through which we read everything. What the naturalist what the naturalist believes is that the ultimate fact, the thing that you can't go beyond, is the vast process in space and time, which is going of its own accord. Inside that whole total system, every particular event, such as you're sitting and reading this book, happens because of some other event has happened. Again, now notice the causality is moving forward with time, according to the timeline. Each particular thing, such as this page, is what is because um, is what is because other things are what they are, and so eventually, because the whole system is what it is, all the things and events are so completely interlocked that no one of them can claim the slightest in independence from the whole show. None of them exists on its own and goes off in its in its own accord, except in the sense of what exists. Again, this is Sam Harris's um, scientific vision. That is the way of the world, and. 
Now, Lewis and Miracles will basically say that reason, our capacity to exercise will and organize and have purpose and all of this, this is an intrusion into this imagination of the whole show, and Lewis will construct his whole argument there. But again, notice we're, we're right here in after the change into modernity and the change in the world and you know all of these things that Verveke is talking about with, um, with Scotus and Occam. Now, so we have this, um, this, this, this fusis to grow. In one instance, in Homer, it denotes external form of nature of the curative herb Molly. The first is use of man's etern um, form Pliny. Um, on and on and on. Now I got to find um, where I wanted what I saw with this as I um, had my brainstorm in it. Okay, I should really use the highlighting feature when I find something that I want to find again. Now, now this also means birth, often. Occurs for the first time in the pre-Socratic pre philosophy, and they have the footnotes and what's lovely about, um, I'll make sure it's selected, what's lovely about, about Logos is that you can put it over it, and if in fact you have the book, but it'll, it'll give you the reference. And so it's basically, it's, it's similar to um, Genesis, the Genesis. Well, 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 wait a minute, the nature, the Genesis. But, but in what way? In, in sort of the temporal way, as correlative of, in a sense, the telos. Something that is created is created for something. And so in this... In this sense, it's created for something. Now, here's the difficulty we have with this change in our assumptions around first as temporal sequence or first as ordering priority as arche as with with a sense of telos and purpose and intent built into it because the question is what do we mean by nature for females exchange natural relations for those contrary to nature well if nature has no purpose within it there's no contrary to that purpose in terms of any ends. And, and this is where natural law gets funny because it's very much dependent on your understanding of nature. And the predominant understanding of nature today is, as Lewis is engaging with, well, this, this thing that goes on its own, and built into that is, of course, this thing that has no purpose to it, and it is for nothing. And so, you know, part of the part of what goes on if you read something like that, um, for their females exchange the natural relations for those contrary to nature, and likewise also the males abandoning the natural relations. Well, what on earth is a natural relation? Because obviously, same-sex attracted men and women would say, well, it's absolutely natural for me to be with other men or with other women because that's my nature. Well, how on earth are we understanding that word in that context? And when I say context, I don't just mean in that little immediate context, but in fact, within our entire worldview, you know, that that if if nothing intervenes, that is in fact what um what what one who is who finds themselves and, and even that turn of phrase, I find myself. Well, well, that's funny. Suddenly, this is what's natural for me, or this is what's natural for her. Okay, but what on earth we, do we mean by nature? And I think Paul's understanding of nature is very different because there's telos in the man and the woman, and that telos is has a lot to do with a whole lot of other things, um, has to do with their creation. 
and, and what they were created for and what they were created to be joined together for. That is their nature, not in terms of so much Lewis's, well, if, if nothing intervenes. And, and this then gets into this apocalyptic vision that John Baer is, is talking about. Were following him, while the disciples were following him around, they really didn't know who he was. Yeah. You know, what kind of man is it that can, um, you know, calm the waters and this, that and the other? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Even when you get to the Gospel of John at the beginning, where you've got Philip telling Nathaniel, we found the one of whom Moses spoke in the law and the prophets also. You know, you, you think Gospel of John, the highest level. The scriptures aren't open in synoptics until the end of the synoptics, Road to Emmaus and so on, and that's when they get it. Gospel of John, it starts off in the beginning. We found the one of whom Moses in the law speaks and the prophets also, but then he carries on, Jesus, the son of Nazareth, uh, Jesus, the son of Joseph of Nazareth. Mm -hmm. well, that's not quite who he is. So it's still working that way. After the Passion, as the scriptures are unveiled, we now know who he actually is. He's the eternal word of God. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So there's an unveiling of in Christology. Mm -hmm. yeah? Yeah. Um, but this unveiling is now also an unveiling of ourselves so Paul in 2 Corinthians 4 and 5 talks about a veil light lying over our minds Yeah. so the unveiling would be you know I come into existence as a result of my parents act of sexual procreation mm -hmm. yeah? and then you get into all sorts of discussions about you know sin did my mother conceive me original sin whatever all of that yeah and I think it's completely mistaken the problem with my birth is not whatever was going on between my parents. The problem is that I was passive in it. Mm -hmm. yeah, I had no choice. <laughs> yeah. Nobody. I was passive in it. It was. It was what C.S. Lewis, within the modern context, is saying. This. This is how. This is how we we come to this word nature. That this is this is this is what is natural to me, in terms of the modern definition. But it's not natural in terms of the apocalyptic definition. Because the apocalyptic definition says, yeah, you were born and you had this and you did this and you did that and you went all through that. But of course, the God of providence is also working through that right there. And he's saying, no, I am going to... Oh gosh, I sound so orthodox. <laughs> it's happening! <laughs> I know some of you are thinking it out there. But it, but is this is this unveiling about this what we were what we were made for. Okay. What we were made for. And 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 that is obviously there's temporality that flows through that. But then a whole bunch of this other language from before the foundations of the earth. And all of that language then begins to make sense and say, no, your true self. And, you know, we've talked about the secret, sacred self, and that sort of gets divorced from this because your true self, and you read the book of Revelation, have all these things with time and names. And, you know, Sam talked about, you know, we're hidden with Christ, you know, in, in the heavens. We are seated with him. So what do you mean I'm seated with him? I'm, I'm seated here on Florin Road in Sacramento, California. No. There's a revelation that is underway in time in the lower register. And so when it, when it comes to this, this question of the revelation of ourselves and what we are for, and um, as we get into what is natural for us, this definition of natural, I think we're going to have to think quite a bit more of and, and, and now this is going to have to get into pastoral care and ecclesiology. So I didn't play the whole video. I, I watched the whole video. And um, part of what the particular misery of the Christian Reformed Church now is, how, how are we to, to work our way through this? In this conversation on CRC Voices, I posted this letter I had a talk with a CRC veteran minister who had a very successful past uh, career, mostly in pretty conservative CRC congregations. He's a wonderful man who I respect very much and enjoy. 
He's conservative on the same-sex marriage issue, but has a gay daughter and a same-sex marriage with children. He told me it's not a salvation issue. To my, um, to the best of my knowledge, his daughter doesn't go to church and pretty much lives a secular life as a same-sex family. She kind of rolls her eyes at church. That uh, church people, they're they're they're, they're kind of silly. You know, they're kind of silly. They don't understand. They. They don't understand the natural way of things. I found a, I found a, there's a YouTube, some YouTube comedy shows from Taylor Tomlinson, Tomlinson, something like that. And uh, she, towards the end of, I think the most recent one, she's talking about sex and she's basically displaying the, the attitude towards sex that is growing in the culture and is now considered natural. Isn't it funny how our definition of natural changes over time? Salvation issue. This language is part of the problem. It's used to try to pull the issue back from the brink, but I think it distorts more than helps. The language is buried in a performance eternal salvation framework that is not unbiblical or necessarily problematic in and of itself, but is limited and I think it encumbers, especially in this conversation, it doesn't really take into account some of the stern biblical injunctions against sexual immorality. You have to take those things seriously. Nor some of the strong liberationist language that scripture also has. You have to take those things seriously too. We need a way of reading both without losing the power of both. That's what theology is for. That's what the church is to try to embody and implement and live out. Confessional, confessionally, the obedience we owe God is not out of condemnation avoidance, but out of gratitude for the salvific work he has already accomplished. Listen to any of my sermons, misery, deliverance, gratitude, misery, deliverance, gratitude. We don't save ourselves. We're incapable of that. What do you mean by saved? I mean everything by saved. I mean becoming fully human. I mean living into our natural state that we have never possessed yet. We want to know about the shape of an obedient, grateful life, not a life biting our lips, avoiding a withholding judge. Not that God isn't a judge, and not that he isn't a perfect judge, and not that he isn't a stern judge, but we are now his sons, and he disciplines those he loves. But the goal as C.S. Lewis notes in Mere Christianity, is not that we would become food, as the devils would have us be, but that we grow up and to become sons and to become like him, to grow up into our nature. See, now when I used it that way, it's just like, oh, wait a minute. But our true nature. Hmm. We have a lot of questions about sexuality and normativity right now. But when we press them into salvation by works, we betray other things. I could go on for hours on this, but I don't have time right now. Maybe I'll make a video. So I am making a video, but I'm not going on for hours on this. But I, I, we have to set it up with this, with, with I think, we, we have to understand the ancient way of, of reading the text. Otherwise, we slip our contemporary assumptions of what nature means into it, and suddenly... Well, the text makes no sense. It's obviously natural for, for him to produce, for him to pursue him and her to pursue her. And what the Bible is saying is that, oh, that's certainly what they feel to be authentic, let's say. But there is an apocalypse that we need, and that apocalypse, as in the day of the Lord, is our salvation, and it's also condemnation. The day of the Lord is that is that double-edged sword. The conservatives lend uh, the conservatives tend to hit the hit the fear drum on this. In the long term, it won't get them what they want. I think progressives are naive about what else is being included in the sexual liberation package. They won't get what they want either. That much is clear. Salvation is both now and forever, but in different ways. Obedience is a part of that salvation itself. I'm very frustrated that we actually have a very nuanced theology of the Christian life, but we forget it when we fight over things like this. And, and we don't know, we don't know how to 
organize ourselves to embody and pursue. Not a salvation issue, I think, doesn't help either side ask, how should we thank God for the things God has done for us? What does that thankful living look like when it comes to this? How does it scale not only communally, but also intergenerationally? And we have to ask, what is our true nature? Boy, but I said that word. And how, However it is we store meaning flooded in, but we have to be a little careful with that. I think if we I think if we started there, we could be more generous to each other and more creative about what to do with our communities and our institutions. So I am I am out of time, but I don't know if piecing this whole thing together will help anyone but me. But as I tell you all the time, I'm a very selfish YouTuber. I do this because it helps me. And if it helps you too, I'm all the happier. But when it comes to why I make what I make, I'm trying to become more natural according to what my creator has in mind for me to be. So there it is. Leave a comment. Let me know. I have no idea how I'm going to title this one. <laughs>